So welcome back, everybody. Um, we will start the afternoon with Mike Osman. I think he's, he's very well known. And especially Mike made my personal life a little bit much more paranoid. Um, because after using hack, uh, uh, RF devices and spotting a guy uh, installing a smoke detector in my apartment and telling me that he don't have to come back for maintenance, he will do it from outside, um, I got a little bit more paranoid. And I think Mike will um, make even my life much more harder nowadays. Um, he will talk about rapid uh, radio reversing. And um, let's see what he has prepared for this day. Thanks everybody for, for uh, being here today and uh, thanks to Troopers for uh, having me here once again. It's always a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I see a few uh, blinking badges out there which I'm excited about and uh, it's part of the reason why I haven't slept much this week uh, <laughs> along with a lot of other people. Uh, I'd like to talk today about techniques for reverse engineering radio uh, systems, in particular, like low speed digital radio uh, control and communication protocols. And uh, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out how a radio interface works, the, there are kind of a couple of different uh, ways you can go. Uh, and it depends basically on what the, the, um, the target is. Like if the target is using Wi-Fi, the default hypothesis is that they're doing security right and you want to test it to see if they're doing something wrong. Um, but if you're testing some kind of a, a low-speed consumer device uh, or uh, industrial device or something like that that is a proprietary, uh, a proprietary protocol as opposed to something standardized like Wi-Fi, if it's a proprietary protocol, the default hypothesis is that there is no security on the wireless communication link. And so uh, if you want to test the security, what you want to do is try to figure out have they actually thought about security at all. That's step number one. And in order to do that, you need to reverse engineer the, the system to the extent that you can see, like, is it encrypted? And um, to do this, since these links have, many of them have just zero security features whatsoever, um, it's, it should be, in theory, extremely fast and easy to reverse engineer them. So uh, what I'm trying to do in this talk is show that if you use the right tools for the right part of the job, it can be extremely fast and easy. And in particular, I want to use a combination of software-defined radio, SDR, and non-SDR tools, because software-defined radio is uh, probably the, uh, or certainly the, number one most powerful tool that you can have at your disposal if you want to reverse engineer wireless systems. Uh, but it isn't necessarily the fastest and easiest way to do many of the steps in the process. Uh, it is for some of the steps in the process and isn't for others. So uh, I'm using today HackRF1 uh, as my software-defined radio platform. And most of this talk is just going to be a, a demonstration of techniques. Um, and uh, so today I'm using HackRF1. I like it because I designed it and I'm totally biased, but uh, what I'm talking about today can be done with any software-defined radio platform. Um, and SDR has a lot of strengths. It's universal in that it doesn't matter what modulation technique uh, the target device is using, you can capture it, intercept it, analyze it, figure it out, uh, replay, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and typically over a very wide range of frequencies, too. Of course, it depends on what your SDR platform is, but in the case of HackRF1, we can operate from around 1 megahertz to 6 gigahertz, which is kind of a ridiculous uh, operating frequency range uh, that covers a lot of different things. And um, we can detect and, and, and analyze arbitrary modulations, and we can do replay attacks really, really easily. Uh, even without figuring out what a modulation is, without decoding anything out of it at all, we can just try replaying. Just like you know, pressing the record button on a tape recorder and then pressing play and uh, see if it works. Um, SDR does have some weaknesses, though, in the particular task of uh, reverse engineering things like this. Um, 
it, it requires a, a pretty steep learning curve. You have to learn a lot about SDR before you can really do all the things that you'd need to do to uh, fully reverse engineer a wireless communication link. Um, and in particular, it becomes more difficult to work with uh, when you start getting to packets of digital information and you are working up the protocol stack. It's the uh, best tool for the job to figure out the file layer, but figuring out the Mac layer, for example, um, it's a little hard. It depends on what the protocol is and what tools you have at your disposal and what your skills are, how far along that learning curve you are. Uh, it suddenly slows down once you start trying to deal with the packets. And so the speed of reverse engineering uh, is, is really kind of slow overall, even though it's super fast for the first, uh, the first stage of reverse engineering. Uh, for my non-SDR platform, I'm using Yardstick 1. Again, something I designed, so I like it. Um, and Yardstick 1 is based on uh, the, the microcontroller and radio IC, the CC1111 from Texas Instruments, which is uh, the same chip, more or less, as the one that's in the IME, my favorite pink, pink toy uh, that I wrote a spectrum analyzer for some years back. And um, it's, uh, it's an older chip in the family that is actually the chip on your Tourcon badge. The Tourcon badge has the brand new CC1310, uh, which is, what's? Not Tourcon badge. Did I say Tourcon? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, they're both fantastic <laughs> events that I love, uh, I love going to. And they both start with T. And they. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Troopers badge that you have around your neck has a CC1310, and that is a brand new part. Um, it's a lot like this CC1111, except it doesn't have a USB interface, unfortunately. They don't have one of the new, uh, the new version. Does, the, the, they don't have a variant with USB. Um, and they, uh, uh, but it has a slightly more capable radio, and it has a much more capable microcontroller in it. This is a terrible little microcontroller built in. Um, it's just barely enough to do the job. Uh, but the one on, this, on the CC1310 is, uh, is a much more capable micro microcontroller that you can do a lot of cool things with. So uh, incidentally, I'm working on a spectrum analyzer application for the Troopers badge. So uh, look, look for that in the coming days. It should be some firmware that you can put on your badge and just use it as a handheld spectrum analyzer, which will be fun. Um, it's totally capable of doing that. And uh, so in this case, today I'm using the Yardstick one because it has similar radio capabilities. It can interface, I could, I could, for example, intercept communications to and from the, the, uh, the Troopers badge. And, uh, and it is being used, I believe, by uh, Yardstick 1 for infrastructure for the badge project here at Troopers. Um, but today I'm going to use it to reverse engineer something else. And um, these, it's based on the CC1111, which is one of, these, one of many wireless transceiver ICs, integrated circuits that have a digital radio modem on a chip. And there are many of these different ICs uh, that, are, uh, that tend to be fairly easy to work with if you ever have done um, like uh, microcontroller programming at all. Uh, you can like hook them up to a microcontroller, like uh, if you've worked with an Arduino or something like that, you can get a development board for one of these wireless ICs, connect it to your Arduino, and then write code on the Arduino that uses that radio chip to do stuff. Uh, I'm doing the same kind of thing, except with Yardstick 1, I have RFCAT firmware, which means I can use RFCAT on my host computer, my USB-connected host computer. And uh, so I don't have to program the microcontroller every time I want to use it. I can just do things from a Python shell, which is super convenient. So uh, the strength of the IC is that there isn't much of a learning curve, because a lot of the functions that you would have to do normally uh, in SDR, uh, yourself, in your own software that you write, uh, are taken care of by the little uh, modem on a chip. And it's particularly good at dealing with packets, with dealing with the Mac layer as compared to software-defined radio. And once you get to that Mac layer, uh, dealing, with, uh, dealing with the reverse engineering, the next steps of reverse engineering, 
are uh, a lot faster than they are with SDR. But you might have trouble just getting to that point, like getting past the phi. So uh, that, and that is the, uh, the, the weaknesses of the, the IC. It's difficult to reverse. It's just difficult to find the frequency of the target device. It's difficult to find the modulation of the target device. It's difficult to find the symbol rate or the bit rate of the target device. And so I'm going to use SDR for those things and then use yardstick one for something else. Um, also, uh, transceiver ICs only support uh, a finite, a small finite number of modulations. However, most, uh, most proprietary low speed digital wireless communication links only use a very limited uh, range of modulations, like 2FSK or on off keying. Very simple modulations that are, uh, you'll find used throughout the vast majority of devices. Basically, any device that doesn't need a lot of throughput is likely to use uh, those very similar modulations that it will be supported by most wireless transceiver ICs. Uh, so we're going to use both for their complementary strengths. And I, uh, I want to just mention before I get started on the demo that uh, I was kind of inspired to do this talk by, uh, by some talks that happened last summer um, at uh, uh, DEF CON, Black Hat, and so forth. Um, Open Sesame is, a, is something that Sammy Kamkar talked about last year. The, uh, he took the IME that I mentioned earlier, and he implemented a uh, fantastic uh, garage door open, opening uh, uh, tool where he was attacking fixed key garage door openers, uh, the, you know, the kinds that don't have a rolling code, which are still around. And um, he figured out how he could do a brute force search, uh, a brute force attack, transmitting every single possible fixed key code in about eight seconds from this children's toy. And he also um, put out some other tools and, and uh, techniques like his roll jam attack, which was a, a jamming and replay attack on on uh, rolling code systems. And uh, he, he was doing this, he was reverse engineering last year a lot of different uh, remote keyless entry systems for automobiles and different garage door openers. And he was trying to get his hands on as many different things, similar types of systems as he could. And in the process, I kind of noticed that he was following this methodology of using software-defined radio for the initial reverse engineering steps and then turning to Yardstick 1 um, or some uh, related tool, uh, similar tool, and uh, for the rest of his uh, approach. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then also, uh, Mike Ryan and uh, Richo last year, and they're both here today, and uh, last year they did this uh, talk on hacking uh, uh, electric skateboard and, and were attacking the wireless interface in the electric skateboard. And I noticed that they did the exact same thing. They, in their reverse engineering efforts to, deter, to figure out the communication control protocol for the, uh, the electric skateboards from multiple different vendors, uh, they used software-defined radio for their kind of initial reconnaissance to figure out what was going on in the radio spectrum and, and learn those basic parameters of the system. And then they turned to Ubertooth One, which is a, a board very similar to the Yardstick One, but that operates in the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's originally designed for Bluetooth, but it's one of these kind of general purpose, low cost uh, radio chips on a, on a USB dongle, very similar to Yardstick One. And so Mike was able to write custom firmware for Ubertooth uh, to more quickly do things that in theory could have, could have been done with SDR, but he, he used this hybrid approach of SDR and non-SDR tools as a part of this project with Richo. Uh, so today uh, I'm giving a review of the Stealth Lock, which is a uh, radio-controlled cabinet lock. And this is a device that you kind of install on the side of a drawer or a cabinet, and it uh, has this little piece uh, separated by this temporary red thing here, uh, that uh, attaches to the door, and then uh, this part attaches to the inside wall of the cabinet. And you, uh, uh, you can lock it or unlock it by entering in a 
pin into this uh, little remote control unit that can be placed somewhere, it can be hidden, uh, or it can just be mounted on the cabinet or whatever you want. Um, these things are used, uh, you know, they're, they're marketed for like, uh, you know, locking your personal documents or things that you don't want your kids getting into or stuff like that. Um, I've actually, uh, a friend of mine in Colorado went, had to go to the emergency room not too long ago and noticed that there was one of these stuck on a cabinet in the emergency room. Uh, <laughs> not sure what was in there, but, uh, but they're used in a lot of uh, 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 commercial and home settings to, uh, to lock cabinets. And it, it, one of the nice things about it is that it's kind of hidden. It's like hidden inside the cabinet. And this little remote control could be anywhere. It could be hidden inside another cabinet or uh, someplace. So, so it's a, it's kind of, you're kind of buying security through obscurity. I think that's kind of one of their selling points. And um, I wanted to find out, uh, actually I bought one of these uh, just to see if it would be cool to reverse engineer uh, for a talk like this or for my, uh, my SDR video series or something. And, and I got it out of the box. And the first thing I noticed was the mechanical design seems pretty cool. Uh, it seems to be pretty well built, although I question how you're supposed to deal with uh, battery failure. But um, the, the one thing that uh, I noticed right off the bat is that it didn't seem to work at all. Like, I'm, I'm supposed to be programming it, I'm supposed to be uh, uh, kind of enrolling with a new pin, set it, setting the pin, and it doesn't seem to be working. And so I had to actually reverse engineer it just to figure out how to get it working. <laughs> uh, and I very quickly determined that there's this little LED on the control pad that lights up every time it's transmitting. Uh, so that makes it easy to know what's going on. And one thing I noticed was as soon as I put batteries in here, this lights up. Before I touch anything, you're supposed to like enter in a pin and then hit the lock or unlock button, and then it makes a transmission. That seems to be how it's supposed to work but it would always transmit as soon as I put the batteries in for like three seconds or something like that. And then I would go enter in a pin and lock or unlock and it would never transmit any other time other than that first time when I put the batteries in. And I thought that was weird. And I, and I got out my HackRF and started sniffing it and, and confirmed that, yeah, it was only transmitting during, those, uh, during that time. And uh, so it sat in my drawer for a long time, and then finally, months later, I got it out, and Taylor, who works for me, uh, he, was, he was looking at it, and he said, let's try to get that stealth lock working. And uh, so we were figuring it out, and try, trying to figure it out, and I, just kind of confirming what I had found months before, and, and he started taking this thing apart. And it turns out that the, uh, the membrane keypad was stuck to the PCB. So he, he like peeled it apart, and put it back together, and then it worked fine. So we had to disassemble it before it even worked out of the box. And we had to start reverse engineering it just to figure out what was going on. Um, but after we fixed that, it worked fine, and every, it's been very reliable uh, ever since. So to get started reverse engineering it, of course, the first thing I like to do is use scc.io, which is a uh, quick and easy tool from Dominic Spill here that lets you look up uh, FCC IDs in the equipment authorization search from the Federal Communications Commission in the US. Uh, super handy for any device that is sold in the US. And many devices that are sold in Europe, for example, are also sold in the US, or there's a version of it that's sold in the US. So you can still use this tool. Um, we were using it in my SDR class earlier this week, and a bunch of people and students in the class have brought various uh, toys that they wanted to uh, try reverse engineering, and, and we found that there were FCC IDs for several of them. So um, maybe not all of them, but, uh, but some of them had FCC IDs printed on them, even though they were devices sold uh, here in Europe. And uh, some of them that did not have FCC IDs printed on them, we were able to do a little, a little searching online and found that, in fact, they do have FCC IDs, and we could look them up. And when you look up the the FCC ID on FCC.io, you get something like this. So I just typed in the, uh, the FCC ID for this particular device, which is the remote for the stealth lock. And, and this is the first uh, page that comes up. 
in the, uh, the FCC ID uh, search results. And it is, uh, uh, it, it's just kind of a, a, a launch page. Usually I will click on that detail link on the left hand side and then uh, look at all the, uh, the documents that are filed with the FCC, like the test report and internal photos, which are super handy. You, don't, you, you look around on the inside of the device without having to crack it open. But today, uh, I'm going to ignore all that, and I'm just going to look at that number on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, upper frequency, lower frequency, the range of frequencies that this device is, is uh, authorized to operate on is right at 315 megahertz, and that's it. So that tells me exactly what frequency I should start my search on. And it just saves me some steps of having to hunt around and figure out what, what frequency this is. So I'm going to skip all the other things that I could learn from this filing and just take that one piece of information, that 315 megahertz. And um, now the rest of the demo, the rest of the talk is going to be kind of a uh, live demo. And uh, so I'm going to plug in my HackRF and my HackRF1 here. And I'm going to use, how about Osmocom FFT? And I can give it a, a sample rate, 2 million samples per second, sounds good. Uh, I think it's minus S. Is it? Sure. And I'll just tell it my center frequency of 315 megahertz. Now I do have that little spur in the middle, which could get in my way, but let's see what happens here. Uh, I'll set peak hold, so I get that green line that kind of shows me the highest uh, power transmissions that happen. And if I type a pin and hit the lock or unlock button, hey, look at that. Do you see that thing just to the left of center there? Just to get it away from my center spike, I'm going to tune a little higher, maybe 315.5, and um, and I'm going to go ahead and record a file. Notice that I can enter the pin and no transmission happens. But uh, here, if I hold it kind of close, there. Now that I've tuned away from it, it's very clear, clearly off to the side of the screen. Um, if I uh, enter a pin and then hit the record button, and then transmit the code, and then hit stop. Now I have a file save that is a capture of that entire radio transmission. Um, and I could try replaying that, I could try doing various things, but I'm gonna use a tool called Inspectrum. And uh, I didn't wake up from my nap in time to uh, recompile probably the version I should be showing you. So I'm showing you some experimental version uh, oh, no, this isn't too experimental. This looks good. Uh, <laughs> except that it is, uh, it's the only thing that this, is, that this shows you differently than many other SDR uh, spectrogram analysis tools is that in Spectrum, shows the spectrogram with the time axis going uh, horizontally. So this, this gives you a colorful plot of the entire uh, uh, radio spectrum over time. Well, that, that two megahertz chunk of spectrum that I captured over the time, over the duration of the capture. And that spike down the middle is now this green line across the middle of my screen. So if I scroll horizontally, there you can see where that transmission occurred. You see that? And I can use this tool and I can use Osmocom FFT to measure the precise frequency, which was just a little bit under 315 megahertz. And I can use Inspectrum here to figure out uh, characteristics of this modulation. Now, one thing you'll notice as I scroll to the side is that the frequency is very consistent. It doesn't move up and down uh, the frequency spectrum, which is up and down vertically on my screen. Uh, but it does seem to be broken up into a lot of little squares. And if I kind of zoom in on those, you can see they sort of look like uh, little I-beams uh, the, because they have just a little bit of sp spreading vertically through, the, through various frequencies just uh, because of the abrupt start and stop of these pulses. 
but for the most part, they're just a CW, a continuous wave pulse. So we find that this transmission is made up of a whole bunch of distinct pulses. They're all on the same frequency, and it looks to me like this is on-off keying. On-off keying just means it's a radio signal that turns on or off to signal the presence of, uh, to signal data. Is it, uh, and there are various ways that data can be encoded in on-off keying. But I can see right off the bat here that some of these pulses are short and some of them are long. And so that's a, a pretty good indicator. Uh, in fact, I can use this new feature in Inspectrum. Uh, I could say, shh, let's, let's try out, let's try dividing this into eight units. And let's see, if I line up at the beginning of one pulse and I line these handy little guidelines up, look at that, the beginning of every pulse happens at equal intervals in time. That's a nice little new feature in Inspectrum uh, that lets you, lets you kind of analyze the timing of a signal like this. It also shows me some information uh, about the, uh, uh, the bit frequency, which is actually wrong because I forgot to configure Inspectrum with my sample rate, which was two million samples per second. Uh, if I do that and then re-enable this will probably work a little better. Um, and it will tell me, there we go. Uh, oh, I think I have a bug of some sort. Um, oh, yeah. So there's, uh, Inspectrum is a brand new piece of software. And some of these, basically all the features other than the uh, basic spectrogram plot are brand new and very experimental. And I may not have built the version or the branch that I should have. but uh, so I'm, I, these are actually incorrect, but uh, because I have a bug that I think Mike, the author, has already fixed, and I didn't compile the version that has the fix. So, uh, but I can use this tool to measure the symbol rate, to analyze the modulation, and I can very quickly see, for example, that uh, sh there are short pulses and long pulses, and I can even see the Intra, what is it, the intra-pulse timing. Do you see how, like, uh, up, it looks like I have kind of three, if I, if I go to nine bits, you see how it kind of lines up where it one out of, one third of the symbol period is that short pulse duration? And if I go over here, uh, let's see how long the long pulses are. Uh, this is what, like that. Ah, two-third symbol period is a long pulse, and one-third symbol period is a short pulse. So if I think of this as, the, as just like a series of individual pulses, which I, or, or individual uh, uh, units of time, and I now have this kind of divided up into units of time, and if I were to demodulate this based on those, those units of time that are like one third of a bit period, then I would see one, one, zero, or, or like high, high, low power. That's a long pulse. And a short pulse is, is one, zero, zero, kind of a high, low, low. So looks like what I have is a long string of one, one, zero, or one, zero, zero. And that should be very easy it should be very easy to configure uh, my yardstick one now with these characteristics. I can observe the frequency of operation, I can observe the type of modulation, I can observe the, sing the symbol rate, all very quickly using tools with software-defined radio that, where I didn't even have to write a line of code. Uh, I can just use tools, GUI tool tools or command line tools uh, without having to write any code or, or really use any in-depth knowledge of digital signal processing, which of course is underlying these tools. So I'm going to take what I learned and go play with, uh, play with this with Yardstick 1. And I will use RFCAT. Now RFCAT gives you a, uh, make sure it's all plugged in here. RFCAT gives you a handy uh, command line just built into a Python shell, and it's using IPython, so you can use some nice tools within uh, IPython. 
Uh, like for example, D is my dongle, and I can just like do a ping to make sure that I'm talking to my dongle. Yeah, yeah, it works. And if I want to know what uh, what I can do with D, I can just type help. Oh, and I have all kinds of help uh, inside my Python shell. And uh, I'm going to do some of these things that were suggested at the beginning here, like set frequency. Um, and I've made myself a little cheat sheet so I, so I can go through this a little faster. Um, but like, uh, um, I, I have some things like uh, sl.py. So I'm going to be doing things like setting the frequency, d.setfreq. And notice that I'm tuning to just a little bit lower than uh, 315 megahertz, because we saw that pulse. That's the actual frequency that we could observe in uh, Osmocom FFT. And the modulation is configured in RFCAT like so, d dot mod ASK OK means configure the yardstick one for either amplitude shift keying or on off keying. And really on off keying is a type of amplitude shift keying. It's just the extreme form um, where it's all the way on or all the way off. The actual modem rate, the uh, data rate is uh, 2450 bits per second. Um, and that is the, the rate of that, um, that is the, the, the rate of, of those small units in time that are one third of a bit period. Um, and uh, I have a, a couple of things. I could, I could try at this point, I could try listening for this thing and see what happens. But I think I'm going to run into a problem. I'm transmitting, and it's not picking anything up. And the reason for this, if I go back to Inspectrum, if I go back to the very beginning of the transmission, you can see it starts out with a bunch of long pulses, which, of course, uh, I've, I've figured out follow this pattern of uh, 1101011110. And the chip on yardstick one and many radio transceiver ICs kind of expect to have a, a pattern, a preamble at the beginning of a packet that's alternating ones and zeros. It's looking for a one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero. And what it's getting is one one zero, one one zero, one one zero, one one zero. And those two patterns don't correlate very well. So what I need to do is actually um, tell it, uh, is it PQ, what is the command? Uh, packet PQT. Tell it to set its preamble quality threshold to zero. Don't bother looking for a preamble. And now let's see if we can uh, detect it. Hmm, still not getting anything. What else could it be? The next thing I would look for is the sync word. And the, uh, the thing I would like to look for is a pattern of bits. And it's automatically, the yardstick one has a default sync word, which is a pattern of bits that it expects to find at the end of a preamble that, that says, hey, this is the start of a packet. So that it synchronizes correctly to the start of a packet. Now, I don't even remember off the top of my head what the default sync word is, so I better set one. And I could set it to something like 110110, but it probably makes more sense to set it to something like, here, we see this transition. Uh, this transition, I might see like one one zero one zero zero. That might work, or or I might use the trick of setting it to the very beginning here, but giving it some zeros to start with, zero 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 some zeros, and then one one zero one one zero one one zero, because that way I won't I won't be as likely to get a false positive like in the middle of a packet or further into this preamble or something. I, wanna, I only want to get one hit per packet. So what I've done in my cheat sheet is I've used this, this particular hex number. And if you want to look at that in binary, which I often just configure these things in binary, uh, you can see that this, this actually starts with a zero. Uh, uh, so uh, 
uh, there are a few zeros here that Python isn't showing me. So it starts with some zeros followed by 1101011011. Okay, so that's, I'm looking for the very beginning of that preamble. So let's set that, uh, what's the command? It's d.setmodem sync word. And I will make it 06 db, which I could, I could just set it in binary. I could put 0b, 0000, et cetera. Now let's see if we start picking it up. Oh, there we go. OK. Now this looks like a bunch of garbage at first. But do you notice? that it it's giving me received things multiple times. And within the received packets, uh, do you see how there's a lot of repetition? That's a really good sign. We're not just picking up garbage. We're picking up a radio signal that has some repetition in it. And you notice that I, was, I, I ended up specifying my sync word in hexadecimal. And I used, what was it, like 06db? And hey, guess what? We see this pattern of 6db, 6db, 6db all over the place because that's, what, that's the hex encoding of 110, 1101011110, right? So uh, it works out that uh, we're clearly seeing that we are demodulating this thing correctly now. And at this point, we can start to make some observations like, um, like are there, uh, we can kind of see an in spectrum. If we spent some time in Inspectrum, we'd probably see that if I zoom out a little bit. This transmission lasts a long period of time. But see how it starts with this preamble? And then there's some data. And then there's a little gap. And then there's another preamble. And then there's some data. And then there's a little gap. And I forgot to plug in my laptop. And it just died. This is terrible. So what we found is, uh, is that uh, if we keep looking through in Spectrum, we find that the, uh, the same packet happens over and over and over again. And uh, so this system, in order to gain reliability, it actually, and I am missing my Euro power adapter. Wow, I need one. Wow, thank you, neighbor. Uh, we see in a spectrum that, that this same packet is transmitted over and over and over again. So in order to, uh, in order to achieve more reliability, probably, uh, they haven't, they've likely not implemented anything really intelligent like um, uh, forward error correction, uh, and instead they just spam the same packet a whole bunch of times and hope for the best, uh, and uh, which is a really cheap and easy way to get extra reliability in your uh, in your communications link, and that is in fact what they're doing. And we can see that just by observing the pattern in Inspectrum. I can't remember how many times it, it transmits, but a whole bunch of times. Uh, what is going on here? It may be doing slightly funny things because it's only been charging for seconds. You aren't watching this, are you? Oh man, I think it's I think it's unhappy with me. I will try. Oh, do I want another laptop? That's actually a really good idea. Um, but hopefully this will work. What's that? Uh, I don't necessarily need those nodes, but considering that I'm losing time, I probably ought to have them. Uh, the cool thing about this talk is that really, it really doesn't take that much time to do this reverse engineering. I mean, we've already gotten to the point, the point where we have a hex dump of our packet in Python, right? Like, and I was talking a lot, and I, you know, we're already there. Uh, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, I know. Fortunately, I don't have local echo. 
but I have a very long password that's easy to mistype when I'm under pressure. And you know, you'd think I would script this stuff, but like, the script doesn't work the first time, and then you're like, ah, I'll fix it later. Two years later. Yay. Well, you guys are easy to please. Uh, what was I doing? 800 by 600, that worked well. Uh, um, mode 800 by 600. Come on. Oh, wait, what is my XR and R device called? HDMI. Oh, yeah, the year of Linux on the laptop. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do now is skip ahead just a little bit, just to make up for lost time. And um, uh, I'm going to use my little cheat sheet here, which was I had just saved in the RFCAT directory for convenience. Um, sl.py. Uh, oh, look at that. How about that? That's not too surprising. Um, but I hadn't modified it. Um, so all of those settings that I just made in the, uh, command, in the command line in Python, I just took them all from this little block right here. And uh, there are a couple extra ones that aren't really all that, uh, all that important, except for uh, this one, the packet length. I'm going to, I'm going to tell RFCAT to, to only capture 30 bytes at a time. And the way I figured that out uh, was by, and really, I'm not that great with Python, to be honest. I, I like to uh, use other tricks sometimes. Like, you, we saw that there was a lot of repetition in those packets, right? It was like the same short packet over and over again. And if I had, like, what I did the first time I did this was I copied and pasted a big block of that repetitive stuff into uh, like VI and then just searched for patterns. Uh, and I could very quickly see that there was the same pattern and then like a, a short break and then the same pattern and the short break. And I could very quickly see just by looking, doing a search in VI, I could see that it, that pattern was 30 bytes long. So I'm only going to capture 30 bytes at a time instead of whatever the default is uh, for that uh, radio chip. And I'm going to use this cool feature of IPython that lets me do run sl.py. And now I've just run all the commands that are in that file. So I don't have to paste them into my, term, my shell anymore. Uh, so I now have my Yardstick 1 configured more or less the same way that I did moments ago. And I, can, I also have this handy little uh, function, or I will actually, actually, as soon as I run this rxsl. I now have this handy little function, which is basically the exact same thing as that RF listen command, except uh, slightly customized to my needs. So I do like RxSL, what is it? RxSLD is my device. So very similar. I'm doing 0000, zero, zero, zero lock. There we go. Now, you'll notice not all of these are identical because it isn't getting synchronized to the beginning of a packet correctly every time. I'm not using a very good synchronization word. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a synchronization word that has the potential to correlate like one symbol over sometimes. If there's like one little bit error, it might correlate over a little bit. So you can see a lot of these are the same, but then some of them are off by a little bit, like this one right here. Now, something happened there that was wrong, right? And this one right here, uh, well, it seems to be just kind of truncated at the end, so maybe that's okay. But at any rate, um, most of the time I get a nice, I get a nice pattern, uh, but some of the time I don't. The quick and dirty thing is to take advantage of the fact that it's transmitting the same packet multiple times and just throw out the ones that don't look good. So I have a little function that I've made. Um, that is uh, going, I'll just pull it in here, is going to uh, just check 
to see if the packet's valid based on expecting certain bytes to be at certain positions and just throw out packets that don't match that. Uh, so I need to do this and then I need to say like um, if, what do I call it? Packet underscore valid. I need to say if uh, a packet, oops, underscore valid of this, then print. Okay. Now I should be able to, oops, I didn't need to hit control C. Now I can just run this again, load this, this little Python. And this is one of the things I like about IPython is it's both an interactive shell, but it also lets you use an editor at the same time, kind of crudely, but it's great. Um, and now I can use that same command and it should throw out some, but notice how consistent the ones that it caught are. I'll try it again here. Uh, a different pin this time. Oh, look at that. A different pin looks a little different. If I type one, 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 and I hit that, there we go. You see how I've had like three different pins? And most of the time it's getting a packet and I, it always gets you know, more than one packet that, that is aligned correctly every time. So the next thing I want to do is decode the PWM, the pulse width modulation. The pattern of 110 is showing up here in these long integers. And I want to compress that down to one bit. The pattern of 100 is showing up as three bits in these long integers. I want to compress that down to one bit. Really, if you think about it, it's just the middle bit that matters. Right? The first, in, in those patterns, 110 and 100, the first bit is always high, the third bit is always low, the middle bit is the one that changes. So I can just throw out every, you know, two out of every three bits, and I have a function to do that, which is uh, maybe not the best way, but it kind of worked the first time, and uh, it's kind of a mess of bitwise manipulation, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, the short story is, all I'm doing is I'm just like discarding a bit, taking a bit, discarding a bit, discarding a bit, taking a bit, discarding a bit, taking a bit, and compressing those down into one uh, long integer. And then I have a little cheat sheet thing here. Whoops. I just want to print that uh, like so, which is now my PWM decoded packet with the uh, appropriate length hexadecimal integer. And if I run this again and I type 0000, zero, zero, zero and hit lock, I get something like that. I've compressed this down to only the bits that matter. If I type 1, 1, 1, 1, lock, aha. Uh -huh. 2, 2, 2, 2, lock, oh. Looks like maybe I have a bit inversion here, don't I? Zero, 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 zero gave me some Fs. One, 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 one gave me some Es. I think I'm really close now. Uh, if I go in and say like, uh, where is this? Uh, somewhere like here. This looks like the right place. If I invert this bit, right? Am I doing this right? We'll find out. Zero, 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 zero. Oh, I totally did that wrong. Did I have the wrong operator? Oh, I didn't? Oh, you guys are the best. One, 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 one. Two, 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 lock. One, two, three, four, lock. Oh, okay. Maybe I need to rearrange my nibbles. I'm not going to bother with that because it's obvious at this point, right? Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, lock. Six, seven, eight, nine, unlock. Okay. So basically, actually what I have here is uh, like my, my byte order is backwards. This is the start of the byte of the packet, which is really a preamble, right? 
and then I get my pin, and then I get either a, a one or a two, which is my lock or unlock, and then I get this, uh, this last byte, which appears to be a checksum. And it appears to be a very simple checksum because uh, it doesn't change much, like zero, 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 lock, uh, gives me a zero at the end, a zero checksum. Zero, 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 one lock is only, one, I changed one bit and the checksum changed by one bit, right? Or, or like not one, you know, it changed by one. It was decremented down to FF it's from zero, zero. So there's probably, this checksum is probably just, you know, a subtraction operation across each bit or across, uh, across each byte or across each nibble. It wouldn't take us very long. Uh, to figure it out. So, um, as you can see, even with my laptop dying in the middle of the hour, uh, you know, we got through this. I used, I used, I cheated a little bit by using a cheat sheet just to make sure that I could get through this in a timely manner and not have to remember all those commands off the top of my head. But um, by using just a few commands in the Python shell, I'm able to very quickly get these hexadecimal uh, integers and figure out how this thing works. Uh, also, there's an equivalent of that RF listen command that's RF send or RF transmit. Uh, so I can just like copy and paste one of those uh, hex dumps. Not, not one of these uh, without writing an encoding routine, but I could copy and paste one of those, uh, one of those dumps that was like 6 dB, 6 dB, 6 dB, blah, blah, blah. Uh, into an RF transmit and try replay attacks. Uh, replay attacks are also very easy in, with SDR, uh, but they're pretty, once you get to the point where you're decoding the raw symbols of a device like this, uh, replay attacks are pretty easy uh, with RF cat as well. Um, and uh, let me uh, get back to my slides. I don't have very many, but um, uh, but that's uh, you know that's that's my demo, and um, the oh there we are. In the future, SDR is really probably the the better approach in the long run. But as I mentioned today, it's pretty difficult to work with when you want to get to that packet layer, the Mac layer stuff. The stuff that we're able to do in a few lines of Python with RFCAT uh, take a lot more work to do with software-defined radio. But it's just a software problem. And so if people continue to create better tools for software-defined radio, better software tools, it could catch up. And in the long, in the, in the long run, SDR should be better uh, at, uh, at those things and be the best tool for all these things, theoretically. Um, but transceiver ICs, uh, tricks that we do with them could improve in the long run as well. Uh, the ICs themselves are, are getting more sophisticated. And there are some tricks that could be used that I haven't seen implemented for, for doing things like determining the, price frequency, the, the precise frequency of operation and for uh, figuring out like the, the, uh, the modulation layer, the phi layer reversing. Um, so I, I think that we will see better tools for both plat types of platforms, actually. In the long run, SDR is probably the superior tool. But in the foreseeable future, it's going to be very valuable to use a hybrid approach like I used today. And uh, that's my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, find me at grayscottguidance.com and find me around the rest of the day here at Troopers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Maybe one or two questions? Wait. You choose the very short uh, sync word, right? Because um, mm. the, the um, sync word at all is really big. What, what happens if you do it uh, bigger? That's a good word? question. Uh, the, uh, and 
And the reason I chose a short sync word is because of the limitations of this particular wireless transceiver IC that's on Yardstick 1. It only knows how to do a 16-bit sync word or a 32-bit sync word, which is the same 16-bit sync word twice in a row. And if you think about my pattern that is made up of three bits at a time, it doesn't line up <laughs> for uh, two uh, identical 16-bit sync words in a row. So I was limited, and that's, that's the reason why I had to, the, to do that packet valid function, is because I was getting false positives based on having a shorter sync word than I would have ideally had. Uh, so that was a quirk of working with this particular chip that I had limited options for how to configure my sync word. But good, excellent question. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, hi, else? Mike. Hi. Uh, did you try, as for the garage opener, to do uh, some brute force and see how it reacts to this specific device? Uh, like forcing all these uh, uh, four pin digits. Oh, uh, oh, brute forcing these? Yeah. Oh, oh, this. Take the garage or open yeah. or brute force approach or something and like do this brute force. Well, yeah, it won't take much to implement a brute force. Uh, that uh, like now that we've decoded the packet format, it wouldn't be a lot of work to craft our own packets, right? Uh, again, like comparable length program, a dozen lines of Python or something to to craft a packet that uh, is the pin that we choose. And so we should only have to do that 10,000 times to, to brute force the entire search space of this thing. So it's a very practical attack. Uh, annoyingly, it is an unreliable receiver, and that's why this thing has to transmit, uh, you know, a dozen packets or something every time it transmits. It's just because you have to you have to use that repetition to have the likelihood that it'll work. Uh, so uh, a brute force attack takes longer than it should just because you have to be patient and, and try each code several times um, to figure out uh, to figure out if you get it. I haven't actually done it, um, but uh, it's fairly trivial to implement at this point now that we've gotten as far as we have. Uh, also, there are some interesting things on this particular device that you might have noticed, like a, a numeral, a digit from 0 to 9 is encoded as, as a 4-bit nibble. What happens if you give it an, uh, uh, an A instead of a 9? Uh, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. You might actually be able to to program this thing, you, because you use this keypad to program it, uh, like when you pair it together, kind of, you might be able to program it with the yardstick one instead of with this to take a, uh, a hexadecimal code that uh, this little keypad is incapable of producing, uh, <laughs> which would be kind of fun. I mean, if you want to go whole hog on security through obscurity, uh, there's your solution. <laughs> Okay, so Mike, thank you very much. Thank you.